look at that if you've not already seen this page. And here is Dr. Jeff. How are you, man? Hello, how's it going? I'm good, thank you. Yeah, good. It's, uh, it's getting a little late here, but uh, I'm, I'm caffeined up and ready to go. Hey, me too, man. Thanks for having me on. This is awesome. Yeah. Um, is it your first, it's one of your first lives or have you done a few before? I've done a few kind of unofficial ones, but uh, mm. it's more your thing than it is mine. So, um, but I'm happy to be on it with you, though. Yeah, I mean, it's been since the uh, the shutdown and the social distancing started. Uh, we've really got in there and thought, you know what, um, we can learn a lot of stuff whilst everyone's uh, sat at home. Um, right. And I think the page that you run, especially, is right at the forefront of kind of uh, cutting edge dentistry. Um, so I'm really really stoked to have you on man yeah awesome thank you um so just tell me a bit about yourself do you know so the guys at home who don't really know you or uh, know you personally um who are you and why did you start this uh, biometric study club right right so uh i went to school over at usc and uh i was learning from pascal manier from day one of school right awesome um and it was then that I just got to be super infatuated with it. You know, I just wanted to know more, wanted to hear more, get my own quest on it. And so essentially this study club was just a way to share with others. And it was, it started out just me researching my own articles and finding topics out and then finding yeah. pieces online on Instagram that validated that point. And then I was just sharing it with everybody. So it's just grown from there. Yeah, and you kind of got to a point where actually if someone wants to learn biometric dentistry and, you know, more cutting edge techniques and whatsoever's at the forefront, your page is like the first place you need to go now. From Since I've seen it, I've been going, wow, how have I not been on this before? Yeah. Studies are there, papers are there, there's examples of preparations, bonding protocol, loads of things. So uh, I, think, I think the world's got a lot to thank you for in terms of... Uh, getting it all out there in a, an accessible way. No, that's awesome. Thank you. I mean, the whole idea is to keep it scientifically driven, you know, is what you're mentioning. Mm. Um, each step that we do is backed by tons of articles, tons of papers. And so we're not making things up. And so I'm trying to, I guess, simplify it, break it all down and share with it all out, you know, say, say hey, this is what the article saying. This is why we're doing it. Yeah. And then go from, the, from there. Yeah. Awesome. So in terms of biometric dentistry, how would you kind of define it if, if we were kind of going from first principles uh, for the guys who may be D1s, D2s, or are just kind of starting to hear about these things? You know, previously, they've just been trying to get into dental school. And now, now they're sitting there with a drill in hand going, all right, great. Now what? <laughs> right. I mean, the very simple, well, the simplest terms, it means lifelike dentistry, to copy nature, right? You know, bio, mm -hmm. life mimic you're going to copy so from there um you can scale it out a little bit and just adhesively base advanced dentistry and so the whole point of biomedics is to have the tooth be the natural blueprint or the guide on yeah. how we the enamel has certain properties the dent has certain properties as well so when we build back our restorations up we're trying to mimic what the natural tooth has, what it's given us. Yeah, so it's, when you say it that way, it's really, really obvious. However, previously we've been, you know, for example, with crowns, we've yeah. been whipping everything off and then sticking something right back over the top. Right. When you think about it, it doesn't make sense. And you, we talk about this uh, kind of pericervical two millimeters ring of uh, enamel. Um, uh, I can't remember what the actual technical term maybe is for that, but um, that's really, really important. It's an area where caries is likely to re, you know, happen again if we're getting food stuck there. All these bits and pieces, you're getting too close to your biological width. If you're putting a crown in that, that sort of area, if we can avoid right. that, it's going to last longer. Right. I mean, the whole idea is that, I mean, cutting a crown, you're getting about rough numbers, 60 to 70% of healthy tooth structure. Mm just to make room for that crown to fit, if that makes sense, right? You know, so you really don't need to remove so much as or be as aggressive. So the idea is that with biomedic dentistry, you're just removing what is given to you, you know, whatever's decayed, dysfunctional, damaged, and then replacing it with whatever uh, works or mimics the tooth after that. 
Yeah. Uh, and how, how have you kind of, have you done a bit of both kind of methods of, you know, old school and now kind of more biomimetics and how have you seen a difference between the two in your own cases? It's a good question. So, I mean, as well as mentioned before, USC, I just learned biomedic dentistry. Yeah. I, I was actually an assistant before dental school. So I kind of saw it that way. But like, I've never cut a crown on a tooth. I didn't already have an existing crown, if that makes sense, too. Right. Got so you. I've just been doing biomedics the whole time. But that doesn't mean I don't know how to do a crown prep or anything like that. But I just, it's never my first choice by any means. You know, I don't ever need to get to the point where I need to do a crown. So I guess traditional dentistry, um, yeah, we've seen that, in, you know, I just recently bought a practice and a lot of the failures I'm seeing are the ones where <laughs> uh, traditional dentistry wasn't as applied or at least I would have done a few different steps differently. Mm. So in traditional dentistry sense, I'm seeing a lot more failures sooner than what I would like, if that makes sense too. Yeah. In terms of the year, year how many years something has lasted before right we end up having to re-intervene and do something again um right. guys who are watching make sure you get some questions in for for uh, dr jeff as well because we've got a, a real master on our hands here of a kind of a wealth of knowledge of all this stuff as well um i've got one of the one of the posts that you've put up i'll just sort of come around so everyone can see it i think this is really interesting because i think on lays versus crowns is something that comes uh up quite commonly when we start to talk about biomimetics and what's the right thing to do and um, how long is my crown going to last and stuff like that. So what do you think, uh, looking at these kind of preparations, obviously they are really, really well planned and you can see there's a lot's gone into the planning of how it's been cut. Where right. do you start, tooth in front of you going, okay, what am I assessing first? Um, so what I was mentioned before, I'm, if a patient comes in, I'm looking at what that decay is given, right? Yeah. So let's just take one of these onlays. Let's take the one down the center where it looks like the mesial cusp are involved. The one below where your mouse is at right there. So the mesial version of that is open. And then the distal is the, I imagine the cusp probably fractured off, decayed or whatever. Yeah. So that's a good example of where the front portion or the mesial portion of that is good. So let's just leave that. There's no reason to remove that. Completely. And so, yeah. Yeah. And so you're, you're relying on a different set of standards or, or abilities to actually hold that on lay on. There's no retention. You can see from there. It's all adhesively based. Yeah. But by doing that, you're preserving that enamel there and you're actually helping the tooth restore its functionality that was lost from all that damage. Yeah, it's if you imagine in my head, I'm thinking, you know, once we've got an occlusal bit of caries, if you're having to break a contact point, you know, you're going to end up redoing that filling at some point. Is right. it the same principle with an onlay? I don't want to break that mesial contact point because that's another area of potential failure that I'm then introducing. Right. Uh, I definitely agree with that. Yeah, I try to keep everything above the gums super gingival so it's easy to clean i don't want to break any contacts if i don't have to um yeah. and just those same points because yeah if there is potential damage to it it's an easier area where that patient can clean it for one or for two that you can restore it pretty predictably so if biomedic dentistry were to fail typically it's a cosmetic fix you know there's like a cusp maybe it's just chipped off uh you might want to reseal a margin something like that but the integrity of the tooth is still intact. So if the tooth is still vital, that's just what we all care about, right? Yeah. So, yeah. And uh, we had this come up a couple of times in the in the DMs and stuff. People have been asking me a bit about immediate dentine sealing. And obviously, Pascal Mania is, you know, kind of the, the, the big right. guy who's brought this to the forefront. Uh, can you give us some, uh, some tips of wisdom from his kind of uh, teaching that you've received? So with the IDS, the immediate dentin sealing, that is essentially like the backbone, if you will, of biomedic dentistry. That's mm -hmm. why you can get away with doing those preps as what you just showed. Uh, you're literally getting numerous benefits. Pascal, in his recent live video, he mentioned like 20 plus scenarios where he could say where, where, ID, sorry, where IDS was actually beneficial to that prep. Um, it increases your bond strength dramatically about 400% even compared to traditional dentistry. 
Yeah. It's going to set that tooth off so you can't get any further invasion with bacteria in it. I mean, um, like I said, each step that we're doing is all about science. So, so it's, you're relating it back to science how it shows it. But yeah, you can get so many benefits from all that. And uh, for, again, because I think we've got a, well, certainly my audience is a little bit more dental school based. Right. What are the steps to, I, to do some IDS? If you've cut this cavity, um, you've left all your walls intact that didn't need to be uh, taken away and things like that, and you've got this freshly cut dentine, what are the steps that we need to take? So the main difference with IDS um, versus traditional dentistry, you keep talking about that, um, is to do your sealing of the dentin, as you mentioned, when it was fresh, freshly cut, and then doing your impressions, right? Yeah. Traditional dentistry would want to do that delayed step of that. So you would cut it all up, be done, take your impression, send to lab, have them come back. So actually to do your steps of it, you're done with your prep, you have it all cleaned up, you would just do your priming, your bond, or whatever bonding agent you would have, a three-step or traditional self etching system, whatever it may be. And then you'd want to do a little bit layer, a small layer of like flowable to help you know, smooth out any irregularities on it to it or any type of uh, undercuts, whatever it may be. Yeah. And then you would do your impression. So essentially just doing your adhesive layer with a small layer of flowable is what you need for your IDS steps. Yeah, and then do you re-prep your enamel margins to make sure it's nicely uh, exposed? You can. Um, on the very simple terms, if you're not comfortable with that, then I would say just leave it. Yeah. You can get that. But yes, that is the technical way to do it. But a lot of this by myself, what we're talking about, especially with the newer students and what I did and everyone else's, you just take it in baby steps. You know, if that's, not, if that's too much for you and how to retrim or finesse that, it sounds dumb, but sometimes that's overwhelming. Yeah. Then all you really want to do is at least get that dentin sealed with your bonding agent. Yeah. So guys, if, I hope that makes sense. I hope that the guys who have asked me this question are on the live as well. Um, so essentially, once you've cut your on onlay prep, guys, you just want to pop some uh, etch bond, seal it, and then take your impressions. Okay. Uh, and you might put a bit of flowable if there's undercuts to just block those out so it's nice and smooth. Uh, and then you may you may uh, fresh up the margins as well. Um, Rick, uh, Ricky Rose has got a question for us. If the marginal ridge fracture is above the contact point, are you breaking contact for an onlay or an overlay or an inlay, whatever you want to call it? Right. So I was looking at this one too. If the marginal ridge fracture is above the contact, um, it kind of would need to have a picture to kind of, I think, further understand this. But no, if I can leave it, I want to leave it. That might yeah. even even include if there's like a diagonal fracture of it going through that margin. I'm being very selective on how I remove that. If that makes sense. Yeah. That's Ricky's question. But yeah, I want to not touch that as much as possible. If it's meaning if it's healthy enamel, I'm leaving it. If it's fractured, I don't. Care. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, let me just see if I can find a picture of it. It might might be yeah. helpful here to to actually see that. I know there's absolutely tons. That, really good question. I think, I think that these are kind of things where we maybe go to a lecture and you don't want to put your hand up and ask the guy in front of 50 other people. And it's, uh, it's somewhere where, you know, someone can explain it where we're a bit more keyboard warrior-ish from, from our own sofas and stuff. We can, uh, we can ask these questions. Uh, I'm not seeing anything particularly perfect. This might just about show us a little bit maybe. I know this has been a direct uh, composite, but right. he's not really broken the contact there. He's kept it as intact as he could, I think. But uh, even this an example of like, I'm, it's, this sounds really kind of cliche and kind of dumb, but I'm literally only removing what is bad, what is damaged, what is, what is undercut or cracked or decayed, if that makes sense. Yeah. And I'm doing that through like caries dye. I'm doing it through a risk assessment as what we've talked about before. And then even there's like a diagonal dent which you can use, which is kind of hit and miss on people if they have it or not. But like, it's just a laser that helps give a quantified number and how much bacteria is in an area, you know? So it's just another tool, but you're using these tools to help know where you need to go and how far into that tooth you need to remove. Yeah, I think, I think that makes sense. It's uh, um, yeah. also something, you probably want to kind of also em emphasize the importance of magnification with these things. Once right. we start stepping up magnification, you can then see a difference between 
precarious tooth structure. It just looks different when you when you really look close. Uh, yeah, he's saying it makes sense to him. So thank you for that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So once you get in, into magnification, you can also you can see that phys, you know there's an obvious luster to kind of cleaner dentine than there is when you when you've got some a bit more flaky uh, carious dentine. Right. I mean, I was pretty timid in school and I got three and a half. I wish I would have got more. I mean, that was kind of average in my school. Pascal was using like, I think, eights at the time. He was saying to get at least six. I wasn't bold enough in it. Right now I'm using sixes. I found myself squinting sometimes to see details. You know, I want eights, you know, yeah. but uh, yeah, you can't treat what you don't see, obviously. But that's the point is like what you're saying. Once you start getting higher into that, you can definitely see a lot more. Yeah, I think it helps everything. You, if you're doing some endodontic, you're, if you're having, having to go that far, um, polishing of composites, if you can polish it times eight with the actual neck naked eye, your patient's going to think this is an amazing job. I can't see any imperfection at all. Can't feel any imperfection. So it will help further on down the line as well. Yep, definitely. Yeah. But no, I, I mean, that's a fun thing for sure. Once you start seeing things, it's like, wow, you just feel like you missed so much stuff and you can't believe you're like, how was I leaving or how was I working before? Because you honestly feel like you're just leaving as a disaster in there, you know? Yeah. But it's all about seeing all that stuff for sure. Wait till you go work under a scope and that changes things. <laughs> this, right, this, right. This, this fear and shock of what you're now seeing and fear of what you uh, maybe weren't seeing before. Yeah. Um, really good question. Thank you there for, for that, Ricky. Um, Moving on, because obviously now we'll just stick with the, the on-lay thing today, because I think that's probably something that's, uh, you know, changing yeah. quite rapidly. Once you get that back from the lab, some people are cementing or uh, bonding with co heated composite. Are you somebody who's uh, using just composite or are you using a, you know, standard Panavia or one of those kinds of uh, bonding protocols? No, that's a good question, too. Um... I have both and I use both. Mm. Kind of depends on the scenario. Some of it's time. I mean, I don't think that's an, a weird thing to admit, but like my first go to is using heated composite, is what you're mentioning. Um, I like the interface between that immediate dent and seal layer you're talking about, the yeah. composite margin between the two, and it, it attaches fantastically well to like uh, an Emacs or Philip Pasek, you know? Um, I do have Panavia V5 that I use in my office. Um, it's a little more clear, you know, so maybe something like that might be an aesthetic driven while I'm using that one over the other one. Uh, I have no reservations of one or the other. Um, yeah. My first preference is the heated composite, though. It just has better wear properties to it. Um, but Panavia is just great. Awesome. Uh, got another couple of questions in there. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Biomimetic principles relies on the chemistry of bonding to enamel as opposed to traditional preps, which we're looking at resistance and retention form. Is that correct? Yes. And I'm going to take it a step further where he just says bonding to enamel. I'm going to say it's more actually on bonding to dentin. Mm. And that's through that immediate dentin seal. You can actually get a better bond to dentin than you can to compare to enamel. Um, the fact that uh, the dentin is more flexible versus the enamel, you can actually, that actually helps give some resistance to it. So you actually can get a higher bond strength to that. And like I said, that's all backed up by papers. Um, so yeah, there's no retention form to it. It's all adhesively for sure. Yeah, uh, and that's obviously, we, we know that trying to, to bond to dentin without having sealed it, and prepared it and uh, conditioned the dentine correctly is going to give you a much weaker bond strength. So it's kind of mastering that that's going to be the, the key component in this. Right. I mean, you're kind of asking about the protocols of IDS and all that stuff. It's really kind of a loaded question because there's so much that goes into it. Yeah. I use an SE Protect bonding system from QRA as well. It's a self-etching system. So because I'm using that, I'm using air abrasion as well. Um, so it kind of changes how you're treating your prep. The other one I recommend is like Optimon FL, yeah, which you can do a little different steps, you know, so you kind of how you work is based off of what bonding systems you use. And that's all based off your office, you know, it depends on what you're allowed to do and all that. Yeah, I, I think that's something that when I was in my training year after finishing from dental school, 
uh, we had a more experienced clinician come round to the, you know, who was in charge of seeing how we're doing, things along those lines. Yeah. And I now actually work in the practice that he works in. So he, thankfully, he got me a job. So thanks to him. Um, yeah. But the question he asked everyone that he went round was, uh, "Oh, what what bond are you using?" Because he wanted yeah. to know whether anyone's actually bothered to have a look at what they're using. Because there's so many different systems out there. Each system has got to be used in a very different way. Each etch, etching system is going to be used in a different way. And if you don't know what you're using, how are you going to guarantee or tell a patient, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm expecting it to last this, this long or whatever it is. So um, interesting that you, you kind of bring that up as well. I mean, I'm, we're really trying hard to get rid of all that naiveness, you know, or nativity that we all have, you know, from that. We're trying to make as much informed decisions as possible. And that's kind of why I started this whole grouping, you know, just to help them have that knowledge, of, like what you're saying. I'm using this because of this. My office is set up like this, so at least I know how to operate this way as compared to that, you know. I mean, once you know the science behind it all, you can really work with whatever system you wanted to and have it work in your favor. Yeah. Just different products that will help, you know, aid you in a bad day or whatever it may be. You know, it's a very simple saying. But uh, And then um, Scott is asking, do we – have the same principle for dentine bonding prior to digital impressions, or is this something uh, that's come about since then, or would you be doing that with milled only too? Um, no, a lot of biomedic dentists are using CAD CAM mm. in their office, you know, so they do their own milling, things like that. Um, it actually works very nicely because the process it takes, or the time, sorry, the time it takes to do a milled onlay is about 20 minutes anyway, 30 minutes maybe, and then you want to do some, maybe some glazing, whatever. So the idea is that you want to let your bond mature with those double bonds we learned in chemistry back in the day as yeah. much as possible. You at least want a five-minute increment between a few steps. And so if you were to do an IDS, scan it, have it come to the mill, then come back, you have more than enough time for that bond to mature and stabilize. Yeah. But you have all your benefits, even though that's a half hour apart, that's really all you need. And you could bond it all back in there pretty well and be totally predictable and be happy with it. Awesome. Really good question. Thank you, man. Uh, does the traditional preps that rely on resistance and retention um, create stress on the preps? I asked because modified BAM makes the preps more rounded as opposed to traditional parallel preps. Um, yeah, so it kind of goes, I think, back to the discussion where you don't need that retention form. Mm. Uphold it down. You know, I'm not worried about three degree taper anywhere. Honestly, I feel totally comfortable, and I have done them. A total, basically, flat prep as an on-lay crown, if you will, crown lay, where I'm just bonding to it itself. You know, I had a patient that had a tooth number 13. It was decayed to the gum line. It was still vital. We were to isolate it, build it back up, and there's a one millimeter, two millimeter of a crown prep buildup, if you will, and we just bonded it on. So it's pretty flat. Yeah. I don't care about that resistance, and that thing's been on for – it's going on eight, nine months now, and it's been totally fine. Yeah, and that comes down to your pre-op planning, I would suppose, having a look at occlusion, making sure there's no plunger cusps, uh, you know, which are going to occlude onto it, checking right. for lateral forces, all those kind of things, and then feeding into, actually, I can bond this, and we're not going to have any trouble, because I think there's probably, um, I think you've posted my friend's work before, actually, Hanan Imran from London. Um, yeah he was on a couple of weeks ago and he was talking about I used to do X, Y, you know, do these uh, bonded onlays and things and, and they would just ping yes. off and then something clicked and I was, you know, the occlusion wasn't quite right and everything is occlusion based when we're, when we're dealing with bonding because you are essentially asking a little bit of glue to do all the, all the, uh, all the work. So if you're not right. planning it right, you're not going to get a long-term result. So it's, it's important in that side of things as well. Got one right. question as well from uh, Afnan. How can we s improve our uh, study within dentistry? So how have you kind of made sure that you're always stepping forward and stepping up? Sorry, I missed that question. What was the question? Um, how to improve within dentistry. So I, th I think he's asking kind of what have you done to ensure that you're always, you know, taking the next step? It's, it's honestly the science. I mean, that's where I'm letting it go. But even that is very misleading because there's so much crappy science out there. I mean, there's a few authors or researchers that I trust in their work. And even yeah. then you have to kind of filter it because it has to kind of match within a system. 
Um, I mean, so I'm always trying to like stay up on that and see what, you know, people are doing and pushing out and research like that. Obviously you gotta get more training. So, but even just um, kind of like what this is, just hearing what people are doing, see what things they're implementing in their practice and then kind of seeing how you can improve your own from t different tips and tricks. That's why Instagram is so great. You know, there's people out there mm -hmm. just doing fantastic work and that way you can actually try to pick their brand and see how they got to that level of excellence, you know, and vice versa and all that. Yeah. Uh, do you think kind of documenting your cases helped you as well? Being able to oh, go back sure. to kind of, let's say you've been working 15 years, let's pretend you can go back to year one and go, I was doing X, Y, Z at that time. Five years later, I was doing that same case in a different way. And now I'm doing it in another way. And that's because I've seen, oh, I should have done that. Oh, I should have done that. And now we're, we're here. Right. Um, I'm honestly not that great at documenting cases. I mean, that's all the count is, is, is posting people's work, you know, and I do some of mine, but I'm so bad at getting the, the pre, the intro and the post. I get two of the three. Sometimes I get one of the three and I'm just not good yeah. at all. Probably because of the different offices I've been in, but, um, it is amazing to see and go back. You do get so many more details when you take enough pictures, you know, you can see a lot more, but no, for sure. I think that is one of the best. And then, as you mentioned, you get a timeline, a journal of your own work. And you say like, yeah, 10 years ago, I was atrocious. How is somebody coming to me, you know? But that's how we all improve. You see our work and, you, and, and then you could tweak. They were looking for the other Jeff Davies and Jeff Ricasi, you know, back yeah. then. Now, yeah. now they're finding the right one. <laughs> yeah. um, with purple proximity, uh, Apparently, you've recommended a flowable rather than a limelight or something. And after using a fine red diamond, are you etching also? No, I don't know if. Um, sorry, let me read this again because I can see it too. I remember you recommended a flowable rather than the limelight after using the fine red. I'm not sure if I understand the exact question. So, is that like. Ricky, jump on and tell us, I guess, too, though. But um, I'll just start from the beginning. So, yes, if you're getting to basically where you, you had an indirect pulp cap, he's asking yeah. about a line. Like, you don't need those as much. You don't need a line. You don't need a base because there's very minimal benefits, if at all, that it's actually going to work and help restore the tooth as compared to what a foldable might do, you know, right? And so you can still get better bond strength. That, that tooth, that dentin is still going to form those bridges to help, you know, seal up the pulp a little bit. Um, but I use air brace in those deep areas. So I'm not using a red stripe polishing after etching, but I'm yeah. also using a self etching system. So I don't know if that answers or what. Basically, what pulp, yeah. Is a pulp. Yeah. So I like it. I like a self etching system because it's gentler on the pulp. Has a, it's not as a harsh acid. Yeah. To etch. Um, you're creating a better seal. There's a thing called super dentin that traditional three sip does not create. Um, it's an acid base resistant layer to it that the bacteria can't get to. And so I would be doing my caries clean out, air abrasion, a self etching system, flowable of about a millimeter or less everywhere, and then bonding it from there. I've got a, a nice possible example of something along those lines here. Uh, yeah. So that, I think that illustrates what we're talking about perfectly. So we've got our initial situation. We can see caries in this area here, a little bit in the interproximal region here, just as it's coming to the concept point. Nicely removed all of that stuff there. Uh, I think this is then a caries dye. Um, and then we've got, you know, right. clean up. And then I believe that's then your uh, your layer of flowable. So you can see it was probably, probably a little bit close there. So you then put an extra little layer over the top and then do the next step. Right. So that last picture you're showing, um, that's what we refer to as a bio base. And that term means after the prep is cleaned up, it has your adhesive bond layer, yep. a flowable, and then just a, another millimeter of your dentin composite. So that layer is only two millimeters thick. And then from there, theoretically, you can go in numerous directions. You can go in onlay, you can do a direct composite, you can do whatever you wanted to. Yeah. Um, but that bio base is like essentially the holy grail for biomedic dentistry. Once it's stabilized, you can do whatever. And that's like the most important step for the restoration part. Yeah, it's getting yourself to a point where you can then choose a, a suitable right. restoration to you know the clinical scenario and the patient's maybe pocket and needs. Um, 
let's turn that back around. So yeah, that I th hopefully that answers that question. And in terms of learning IDS and biomimetic dentistry, uh, you're probably looking at a manual course, really, aren't you? If you want to go for the absolute perfect, perfect sort of uh, introduction. Yeah, his courses are great. I was honestly, I feel super lucky and fortunate to be able to learn from for the whole year. You know, that was what we mm. had there, and I worked a little bit in the pre-clinic when I could. Sorry, in the clinic at school and stuff, but uh. His courses are great. I'll mention all the courses out there. I took some courses from Matt Najad. He's great. I took a few courses. Well, sorry, I did a two-year basically internship with Dave Alman where I was after I graduated. He, he's great. Anything he offers. And then we also do um, a very casual membership with the, with the study club, what we do. And that is just um, – it's a WhatsApp group and a Facebook group where you can get questions and tips like this, where you can just ask people ideas, you know, we're sharing research, sharing articles. Yeah. And so those, that's a very casual way to do it. Um, but there's tons of resources out there if you already want, we can get into all that too. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you for that question. That was a, that's a really obviously useful thing because obviously people are going to want to see how they can incorporate these bits and pieces into their practice. Um, so that's useful. Any more questions down below? Um, I, I've got a question for you, like maybe more on a personal level. Where, where do you see your career going? Obviously, you're deeply involved within the social media side of things, kind of doing, um, you're doing the dental thing of, of what I'm doing. I'm showing, sharing more people's story. Uh, yeah. I'm a bit of free education now that we're sat at home. But you've been going deep in onto kind of the dentistry side of things and showing everyone's work. Um, right. But where, where do you see it all fitting in for you? Good question. And honestly, that changes daily. <laughs> it's kind of fun. I'm, I mean, I'm kind of a little bit of a dreamer. I like to stay busy with projects and things. Yeah. Dental practice is fun. I don't want to practice dentistry four or five days a week. I get burned out. I like changes and things. Anyways, to get to your question, um, I do like what you're doing. I do like the personal side and the stories of things. Um, I'm working with Garrison on getting a podcast together. So that's kind of fun. Kind of what you're doing. Just hearing some stories, hearing the connections, hearing the people behind it all. But the, the media outlet is definitely exciting, I think. I mean, um, I'd love to, to get different events going on throughout the world, the different things. We were trying to get one out and actually where you're at uh, before this coronavirus took off, you know, where's or, a, yeah. a few of us, were, but yeah, so just things like that, yeah. Where, where was that going to be? Because uh, I'm sure I'm, I can make my way. Well, my we were going to be, we were trying to set up a tour where it was like um, three or four or five different cities out there. I mean, we're going to, I think, to London, UK, going to like Amsterdam as well, going to, I think, Warsaw, we're looking at. There's a few different cities um, over there. I mean, we were kind of just in the planning stages and things, but yeah. maybe after all this though too, though, still, It'd be kind of fun. Yeah, we don't know how long it's gonna, gonna keep everything shut down for, but I'm definitely down if, uh, if it ends up happening. <laughs> um awesome yeah ricky's saying that that's basically what he wanted to hear and he's found himself a new protocol for for those cases so this is what yeah. it's all about Le learning something new in a kind of very relaxed way where we don't have to uh knock ourselves out a little bit too much or anything along those lines uh learn from your sofas at home uh yeah. any more questions for uh for the doc uh, i know you said you, had, you didn't have long today so just let me know if we need to cut it no, you're good. You're good. This is fun. And that's why I was, you're asked about learning too. Like I'm always, I think I respond to 100% of the questions I get in the DMs. Mm. I'm, I might be a little off, but I honestly try really hard to respond back to something that was on a personal level to whoever somebody asked me though. So feel free to ask, you know, I'm not afraid of it. Sometimes it yeah. might take me a while, you know, but I mean, uh, here to help for sure. Yeah. I, I know your pain there. You, sometimes there's nothing in the DMs and then, all of a sudden there's 14, 15 really, yeah. really random requests uh, yeah. in there and you're going, okay, I've got this and that on in my personal life. Let me do one or two a day. And then it just builds up and you oh, God, this is going to take ages um, yeah. <laughs> and you get a bit snowed under. Well, that's where like, honestly, I started doing those, those like FAQ Fridays where I'd have people just ask me questions on things. Mm. And at first it was just kind of a trial, but it honestly got to be so much response. People were asking me maybe like 15% of the questions on the actual respond to the sticker, you know, but then probably another like 50 were responding back on the actual like personal questions just straight to the inbox, you know, not even asking that way. So it's like 
I'm just trying to be accessible, trying to help people, trying to answer what I can. There's so many different topics within biomedic dentistry, getting to like bonding protocols and the material things and treatment planning things and all that stuff. It just is, it's never ending. Yeah, yeah. I kind of just want to touch on it just to introduce kind of everyone to the idea of the biomimetic side or some people might call it minimal invasive dentistry or, you know, just so that we're then aware. And then obviously there's a lot of guys out there who I'm hoping to get on to talk about certain aspects, you know, one by one, like maybe seclusion or treatment planning. Um, yeah. But I just saw your account. And I was like, this is so cool. This is like the entire opposite idea of mine, but in the same sort of vein. Uh, so I've, I've got to get this guy on because, you know, two peas in a pod almost. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, for um, sure. Show, yeah, shows it's going to be on my story for the next 24 hours. Um, and I may well also repost this to IGTV, actually, if we get enough uh, kind of res requests and response. It does take me about three hours to do that, though. Uh, but I'll, I'll do that if, uh, if required. <laughs> right. Um, I'll share it too if you uh, if you if you do that I'll share it. You know, yeah, sorry. I'll I'll uh, I'll send you a link on uh, Google Drive and stuff. Cracks. Should we talk about crack teeth? Because I think that's something that if you're picking up from an old dentist, the, there's been a lot of MOD amalgams, for example, or you know tooth which have had some sort of um, restorative classic dentistry, and now you think, okay, how do we save this tooth? Uh, so sometimes we end up with something along these lines. So from my point of view, I try and remove the crack, run it through and see what we're left with and then plan from there. Um, what, what are your kind of rules of thumb? Let's, let's say for when we're removing cracks. So there's an article by Dave Allman and Pascal Monnier that is talking about the carries endpoint and removal, if that makes sense, on where to yeah. finish that. It talks about decay, but the same concepts are applied for cracks, where those cracks, what you're showing here, need to be removed within a certain parameter Yeah, as to not expose the pulp. So theoretically, you'd like to remove all that you can. It's yeah. not all simple you run into obviously things get a little deeper than easier sometimes you just can't see it because the magnification like we're talking about it can just be hard it's really tough sometimes but no you'd like to ideally remove anything that's any cracks in dentin a crack in enamel is totally fine that's biomimetic theoretically and you can just leave that crack that is in okay. enamel uh once it's past that dej then it becomes symptomatic and problematic and so you'd want to remove um very simply, let's just say three millimeter, three millimeters in from the that surface side, you know, the cable surface, and then five millimeters down from the occlusal, and that would be how you'd want to remove that crack. Okay, so this is what's happened here. You can see a little bit of a an area, if you guys can see on the screen there, where there's a little bit of a crack, and there's probably a little bit here. So it's it's gone right deep into the margin there. Uh, so that's the occlusal you've taken down and scooped it out, and then we've left this one because it's within enamel and then right. an overlay afterwards. Right. And so you do want to, and it's nice to kind of change the forces as what you mentioned before from occlusion to kind of help it be more vertical versus tensile on those problematic areas. That'll help you know, the long term of the cracks, but yeah, everyone wants to do a crown to cover up a crack, but then teeth are always moving, even if you chew them. And so those cracks can get bigger underneath crowns. They'll just be slower. It'll take longer, but it can still cause tons of damage. Is this something where you then start to look at what's called the compression dome or the, uh, you know, the dome prep? You can. Um, that's Graham Milchett's idea. He loves it, and I'm not opposed to it. I would, like, as when you're showing, I would just try to remove that de decayed area, and then I'll kind of, like, what, as you mentioned, just kind of see what I'm left with. Yeah. Um, I'm fine doing a direct composite on it. If it's reinforced and stress reduced and things, you can do an onlay on it. Um, it kind of depends on what's mentioned, but you know those compression domes are fine. Yeah. So this, if anyone doesn't know what we're talking about in compression dome, we have this kind of sigmoid curve. So you've got a couple of little bumps uh, where the cusps would have been, and then you're flattening it off. So you're trying to add a tiny bit of almost retention form there, uh, and then a, a ring of enamel, so we can see there. 
um, with this ring. So you can see the little high high points, four high points where your uh, where your um, cusps were, and then you've gone lower on the kind of around the outside. Um, so that's what that is. If anyone's wondering what we were talking about there. Um, and there's a few things why those are good because it leaves so much of enamel ring. We call it the bio rim around the tooth. Yeah. So it's like a 360 degrees of a, the CEJ and above. So yeah, you have tons of enamel to help support that. That's what we said before. It's a lot of like a vertical occlusion versus you know side to side. You know, stresses on it. Yeah. Um, it's a it's a nice way to do it. Yeah, there are there are no kind of almost wrong answers when you're doing a, a prep like that. But again, it's that occlusion. We need to understand, is this something that's going to be heavily loaded? In which case, we need a little bit more retention, maybe. Yeah. And so that's where it kind of depends on your practice and what you're able to do. Mm. I mean, I've worked in a lot of, like, government-sponsored offices where we couldn't always do that. Yeah. They didn't have money, they didn't have resources for it. So we would just do, like, a stress-reduced composite to it. It's a little bit faster, theoretically, where you don't need to see even two appointments, you know? But um, yeah. by knowing how the science works, you know, you can change it to how you need to practice your style. Yeah, awesome. Any more questions, guys, for uh, for Dr. Jeff? We've covered quite a few different interesting sort of areas there and maybe not gone deep on it like a, uh, a Mr. Manier might do or a Newton Farl or something along those lines. But uh, hopefully it's been an interesting kind of step in towards this kind of dentistry, which you may or may not have come up against previously. So um yeah that's that's been really interesting is there anything that you kind of would say for wherever someone is working whether it's us uh uk based or maybe somewhere where we're a little bit more resource constrained or you might say what is the steps that everybody could be taking to step their game up to that next level um the very first thing i would say is getting a nice bonding agent like I said, there's really only two that I like, you know, Optibon FL or SE Protect. I know that's not available to everybody in every parts of the world. Mm. Um, but getting that established and then also trying to get your carries removal endpoints all set up where you're actually getting the decay out predictably. And then from there, you can do whatever you need to. I mean, there's different ways to help treat that tooth. You know, you can get it stabilized, but um, and not being shy and just doing it, I guess, really, though, you know. Yeah, and this is the uh, Optiver and FL. This is the one that I use as well, which is yeah. brilliant stuff, but really, really strong bond that you get. Probably the gold standard, would you say, within within bonding, if, if used correctly, of course. Oh, right. Yeah, all the research always compares it to those two symbols. Those two symbols like well, Sunny, the Optibond, you know, it's everyone wants to compare it to that one just because that's been solid forever. Mm. And there's it always shows so much good results with it. Pascal uses it. He taught me with that in school. Uh, I have it in my office. I use it probably 10% of the time, just on my own personal preference and stuff, but no, it's great. Yeah. Um, and interesting, you kind of bring up caries management and its endpoint. Where do you stand within the affected versus infected dentine and what should we and should we not remove? So it's that article I was telling you about from Dave Alleman and Pascal Monnier. It really comes down to getting the caries dye and staining it. Yeah. Because I'm not a big believer in having everyone's tactile senses be systematic right we're all taught that in school but what's different for me is different for you you know and all that stuff you know so it's not like a really standardized approach yeah in my opinion, the biomedic opinion um you need the caries die so it can be predictable every time for everybody or the most people and so getting that die out and then removing it so it has a predictable area does that answer your question I, I think, yeah, I, I think so because we had this uh, conversation. I spoke to Rizal Risky from the uh, from Jakarta, and yeah. he goes on more of a tactile sensation. But then over there, his work is incredible, and he is working on the very, very t tight sort of monetary constraints with the patients who can't afford crown work, can't afford to come back a second time because they might lose the job and things like that. So, right obviously you're then, you're then holding to maybe a different standard, maybe as opposed to like in Australia where everything is, you know, 10 out of 10 and you've got all the time in the world to see your patient and things like that. But it, I think speaking to yourself, 
speaking to people like Riz, who are doing really, really impressive work on the different circumstances, does show everybody who's listening it's possible no matter your circumstance. Right. He, he's doing fantastic work. He is. I've actually, he was one of the first accounts that I found when I started this. And um, I, like, as you mentioned, I'm impressed with his, you know, restrictions and constraints he has for the work he's doing. Mm. Um, and like I said, but that carries the die is fantastic. I think it's super cheap. Everyone can use it. Yeah. It gets a lot of the guessing game and then it helps you see or differentiate between that carries affected or the affected versus the infected and all that. Yeah. Um, and so just because of that guesswork, you know, like I said, it's the most standardized approach that we have available with us, but. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's just something that we need to maybe work at getting into our, our right. workflow because it's something extra new to maybe add in for, for a lot of guys. So right. if, you, if you get into the, like anything, if you get into the practice of using it, then then things kind of can then move forward. Uh, do you have any experience and thoughts with Scotch Bond Universal? <clears throat> Sorry. Um, I'm not a big fan of universal bonding agents yet, as of right now. Mm -hmm. There's too much chemistry going on in one little bottle. I mean, if you think about it, you have a bonding agent, you have a primer, you have an acid, you have all sorts of things in between to help connect things, you know, with different fillers, whatever. There's too much things that has to be stabilized and balanced to have it be done just right, if that makes sense. Yeah. On, a very on a very watered down um, example. Awesome. Yeah, it's like giving your shampoo, conditioner, and like a lotion in one. You're right. You're not going to do that. I mean, it sounds like pretty grilling, kind of funny. But any anyone's going to know you don't want a little separate just because it's not really going to work too well. You know, ask a girl; they all know. And so yeah, they all yeah. have like five products to you to do one step, and the guys just want to go quicker and faster and dumber. Only one. <laughs> you know, only um, shampoos. That's that's possibly the best. Uh, uh, example of, or way of saying it, I've heard. I mean, it just there's too many things going on that you need it to do. You need to clean. You need to you know to degrade whatever type of you know tooth structure we're talking about there, and then also bond on it as well. Too much going on. I would need to break it down in simpler steps. I mean, I have it in my office. I use like a universal quick from Cure. I don't mind it for like a pediatric patient or an elderly or a very complex yeah, to move like that. Yeah. Just so I, have, I just use it like 1% of the time. That's yeah. all. I, I definitely kind of agree with you, especially if you are going to be working to these kind of principles, you're probably using rubber dam anyway, which means your patient should be a bit more relaxed once you've got it on there. You right. have the time to, you know, you know, really get in there with your priming agent and, and work it in, get in there with the bond, work it in and take your time. You don't need to have to do slap dash. Fly, flying through things like uh, you know like there's no tomorrow and then maybe skip steps cut corners things like that so once you add rubber dam on it speeds you up in some areas but gives you time in other areas to do things properly right it really does and it takes two minutes to put it on and afterwards i think yeah most of my patients actually kind of like it from what i've seen i 90 percent mm. of the time but yeah your work is so much more predictable afterwards you know it's rid of all, a lot of guesswork as well that's the thing i want to get rid of as much guesswork as possible for sure yeah any particular rubber dam tips that you can give us? Tips? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Getting a good dam to start with. I think the Nick tones are pretty solid. Everyone likes those for the high end type stuff. They're not really expensive. You can kind of uh, map out your teeth before. I found that to be the most efficient. You know, either with like a Sharpie or a pen, you place it on the teeth and then actually uh, label where those teeth are at, you know? Yeah. Just doing it, really, just getting, you know, different experiences and exposure with it. There's some good articles out there that have done it, you know, um, if you need things like that. And obviously, they're going to ask me, ask you, things like that. But it's just uh, exposure, repetition. Yeah, for sure. And kind of, I prefer a heavier dam over a light or a medium. I think that makes a big difference. Um, yeah. I don't know if yeah. that's because I'm a bit heavy handed and that's just how, you know, fat fingers, that's how I am. Um, <laughs> But I found when I was using heavy, there's just a little bit more give to stretch it over clamps and, yeah. and you know, push it into the sulci, you know, using your, if you're going to be inverting a dam with uh, flat plastic or uh, floss tie, I'm still flat floss tie actually to, be, to save my life, but um, yeah. that, that, that does help. Also, right. accessory clamps, I think those are a real useful tool when used correctly to really, especially a, a brinker B4, it's just like the... the the best thing that's possibly been ever invented <laughs> right 
I mean, and even then, like, I'm not afraid to even use, like, a slit dam technique, you know? If I just feel like I can't get it on very well, I've tried three times. Mm. Some's better than nothing, you know? So that's kind of the other thing, too, though. Don't stress about it. I mean, we're not really publishing these pictures all the time, so it doesn't need to be per picture perfect for everybody. Yeah. But it's going to be better to have something on than not, that's for sure. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, hi there. I would like to ask if there is an importance of the angle between the surface and the lamp during polymerization. I think absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah, so I mean, sometimes those curing lights can get too hot, too high, or too much power, you know? I mean, you don't really want anything over a thousand, you know? But then if your curing light is really stronger, then what she's saying um, helps with it because then you can kind of control that rate or that polymerization speed or the power, if that makes sense, right? You know? Yeah. I don't want to cure too fast, too quick, um, just to get a quick bond. I actually want to be slower with it. And it might even do like a delayed cure start technique, if that makes sense. Well, I'll actually, we'll back it up off of the tooth about like half a millimeter, sorry, half an inch or so, uh, just to get that chain reaction, the polymerization started, you know. And then I'll go back and do a full cure after I've gone through it all. Yeah, I've started, especially since I started using Optibond FL, almost doing 60 seconds worth of curing from all different angles. Just yeah. because I think, look, I'm using the best possible bond. I'm and with with the uh, curing lights, especially you need to know your curing light. You know how strong it is. You need to make sure you've hit every angle. Um, on the flip side of what you're saying about it being too strong, you can also have some where it's starting to wear out and become a bit weaker. Um, so one thing is, if you, if you have some straws, you know, standard straw that you put, uh, you drink drink through, pop some composite in there, and you can do a, a chair side lamp test to see how well it's working and you know you're curing to depth uh, i found that's a really good one no yeah i've done some of that too i've done it like with like washers too Same thing. Mm. put it inside of the washer and all that uh okay. well, sorry got an instruction. <laughs> we, we, we can cut it there then. i think this has been really good uh oh, maybe right. catch up with you another time at some point um but guys if you're not already following jeff on uh biometric study club definitely go check that out he's also got a personal profile as well uh, and that's jace jeff davies dds um i'll pop this up on story for sure uh and then i'll look at it over the next week getting it sorted out for igtv but you know thank you for coming on i think it's been really useful for the guys to see a little just kind of baby steps in towards a new way of doing dentistry if you're traditionally trained right awesome no yeah like i said here to help you know if, oh, we should do this again it's fun but uh yeah whatever you need yeah awesome we'll we'll speak to you soon and maybe get a single topic and just go just go deep on one topic and see what people want to want to know about uh but thank you for coming on we'll speak soon man awesome oh. thanks sir bye guys okay thanks to jeff for coming on today that was a really interesting kind of uh introduction into that kind of uh, dentistry um if any of you guys have got some particular questions you want to ask jeff definitely go over onto the biomimetic study club and uh drop in a question to him we will get through to you eventually but also if you want to see a tutorial from the two of us going over a certain area of this kind of dentistry then please let me know and i'll try and uh, arrange something um in the near future in terms of the rest of the week we've got a number of clinicians coming on so make sure to kind of stay tuned for that tomorrow tuesday we have uh, thoma jabbar from london she is a aesthetic dentist she's doing a lot of um uh, dentistry around kind of mouth full mouth transformations kind of more towards the aesthetics at the front but also doing some um, facial aesthetics as well so that's going to be really interesting that's going to be at 8 30 uk time um on Wednesday, we've got a couple of potential guests, but nothing confirmed as yet. But on Thursday, we have Shiraz Khan, who we did speak to last week, and he's going to talk through uh, a couple of bits and pieces, uh, very similar to what Jeff has done today, uh, but maybe more in detail. Uh, and I've asked him to bring some of his cases that he's done, so he's going to talk through those cases step by step for you. Um, but also, we're probably going to look at, I think, occlusion to start with, with uh, uh, with Shiraz on Thursday and on Friday we have Krina from 
King's College London. She's a tutor on the endodontics uh, master's program, specialist training program. So we're going to go through some endodontics with her. So definitely stay tuned for those. Um, thank you guys for joining us and we'll, we'll hopefully see you soon.